thank you for coming. Uh, tonight is the last film of Żuławski we're screening as part of his retrospective at ICA, but we have just one more special event devoted to Żuławski, a gig by uh, DJ Andy Wotel, um, who pays a musical tribute to music from his films. Uh, it will take place this Friday at Rich Mix, uh, so you, uh, if you enjoy tonight's film and like Kozinski's music, please join us on Friday. Uh, and now I give you Stephen Thrower who will make an introduction. Hello, hi, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this screening of Possession, very rare screening of Possession in London. Um, I'm going to be reading from notes from time to time because I've seen Possession so many times that I think parts of my short-term memory are forever sort of destroyed. Uh, I think it's that kind of movie. Um, I just wanted to really kind of go through some of the things that led to Possession. Uh, I think it would probably be a little kind of obscene to try and dissect and sort of uh, analyse or tear apart the themes of the film, especially because there are people here who haven't seen it and it just seems unnecessary before you watch a film. Uh, so I thought maybe a good thing to do would be to think about uh, Jouwaski's journey to uh, the point at which he made this film and then perhaps just have a, a brief talk about what he did immediately afterwards. Um, this is a very unique film, one that seems initially to a lot of English-speaking audiences as if it came out of nowhere. Of course, it didn't. Uh, this is a man who had a career stretching back many, many years and uh, Possession was his first and only English language movie. Uh, the themes uh, can be detected going all the way back to uh, the late 60s. Now, um, <coughs> uh, Zhuaski's first two films were short movies, about 28 minutes long each. Um, one was called um, The Song of Triumphant Love, which is based on a, a story by Turgenev. And um, this was a sort of romantic triangle with um, complications caused by Eastern mysticism, which you might find interesting to think about as we approach possession. And um, Pavoncello, which was uh, a story about a man who thinks that he's the be-all and end-all to a particular woman, only to find that um, another gentleman who looks almost exactly like him uh, is her new beau and her new choice. Now, these are themes that seem to sort of dog Shrosky's uh, career. Um, romantic triangles, um, the, the fundamentally vulgar structure, the triangle, he calls it in possession. <laughs> um, and it was one that he returned to over and over again. The, the complications of love, the way love fades, the way that uh, two people can fight over the same uh, romantic object. Uh, and uh, that was there in the first two short films. Now, um, initially, uh, Zhuaski was a sort of protege of uh, Andre Weider. Uh, Vider, obviously a, a, a Polish director of, of great renown and uh, well embedded, shall we say, in, in a, a rather more respectable Polish culture, uh, film culture. Um, but uh, Zhuaski was, um, he was Vider's, uh, as I say, protege. And uh, after, around the 1969 period, I think it was, uh, the two of them went over to the United States um, to discuss the idea of making a movie version of Heart of Darkness, the Joseph Conrad novella. Um, of course, this is the same story that um, Orson Welles had uh, attempted to make as his first film, um, which never happened. But uh, an American producer called uh, Jeffrey Selznick had bought the rights from RKO for a film version of Heart of Darkness, and Vida and Zhuavsky went over to the States to talk about making that. Zhuavsky uh, had written a script, um, this was going to be a fairly big production. It was going to have location shooting in Central Africa. Um, it was a very, very ambitious undertaking. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, <coughs> fell apart uh, because, um, essentially because the producer, Jeffrey Selznick, who was the, I think, uh, the son of David o, o. Selznick of, uh, of you know, great Hollywood fame, uh, Jeffrey Selznick did not have the same magic touch as his father and had rather overplayed his hand. It turned out that the money wasn't there. The, f the whole project fell through and it never happened. But it's worth bearing a heart of darkness in, in, in mind as we uh, approach our journey towards possession. Um, when this project fell apart, um, uh, Zhuavsky went ahead and filmed his own first feature, which was Third Part of the Night, and then his second feature, Diablo, The Devil. Uh, and uh, The Devil 
as you may probably know, was, uh, was suppressed or banned by the Polish authorities uh, on suspicion of being anti-communist. Uh, not a very, very good time for, for, for Zhuavsky, obviously, to have a film suppressed and lost in this way. Um, but he moved on. Uh, he was given, unusually given a kind of allowance to leave Poland uh, and make a film in France, which was uh, his next film, L'Importance de Deme, or um, What Counts as Loving, or it's, uh, it's Important to Love. Um, even then, although that was a, a French-Italian co-production, um, Zhuavsky was forced to give 20% of his fee, uh, his directing fee, to uh, Film Polski, the, the uh, Polish uh, film authorities. Even though there was no Polish money in the film, uh, he was uh, essentially taxed for having made the film. And um, that's uh, an interesting thing to bear in mind when you consider another project which he then decided to do immediately afterwards, which never happened. Um, now this is a, an interesting tale uh, about an Eastern Bloc gangster who um, leaves the Eastern Bloc and heads for the West, uh, gains power and influence, uh, becomes apparently more and more respectable, but is, in se is essentially a monster. So he's passed from uh, a kind of a gangster existence in the Eastern Bloc to a sort of a powerful business uh, enterprise in the West. It's the kind of story that you can imagine perhaps the Polish authorities it's an ambiguous story, but uh, uh, Zhuavsky liked to talk about the idea of uh, progressing underneath a mask. So in the kind of uh, culture that he was working in, you had to, if you wanted to tell certain kinds of stories, you had to have a sort of a, a, a play a double game. And you can imagine that the story of a gangster from the Eastern Bloc who goes to the West and becomes successful on Western terms, only to become even more of a, a, a wicked sort of character uh, in the West, would be a fable, perhaps, that they would have, uh, they would have approved of. But you could read it. Two, you know, kind of two ways, really. Um, that, never, that never got done, that, that never got made. Uh, and after that, uh, Zhuavsky made what was um, probably the most ambitious project uh, of the 1970s for him, which was uh, On the Silver Globe. Now, um, On the Silver Globe, uh, again, many of you may well know that uh, this was a, the most expensive project undertaken in Poland at the time. Uh, Hugely ambitious, over three hours long in its uh, in, in intention. It was intended to be over three hours long. Um, to his immense frustration, uh, he was uh, the plug was pulled on the project when he was about 85% of the way through the shoot. Um, he was forbidden to uh, continue the film. He was locked out of the editing room. The, the materials were taken away from him. The sets were destroyed. The, the costumes were locked away. Um, uh, it's the kind of nightmare scenario that, you know, is kind of, you know, I hesitate to say Kafkaesque, but it's that kind of dreadful situation where you've undertaken an enormous, uh, deeply challenging and deeply involving uh, artistic project, and then just as you're bringing it to fruition, you're sh shut down, you're locked out, and you're forced to, uh, to wave goodbye to it. Uh, that's, that's the immediate artistic background to possession. Because uh, when Zhuavsky was uh, told that this was that he was essentially going to be forbidden to make the film, um, he was forbidden in a very almost like a strangely sweet kind of way. They gave him a passport and allowed him to leave Poland, which apparently was quite rare at the time. You know, it's sort of like to be actually handed a passport. <laughs> it's kind of thing. Look, okay, we don't like what you're doing. We don't trust you. You're telling us it's not anti-communist. Even though we're not sure what this film's about, we suspect that um, that you're um, having a go at us. So please leave. And that was the <laughs> that was the way that he was uh, kind of gently sort of moved out of Poland. Uh, I say gently. Obviously, that's certainly not going to be the way it felt to him. So um, just to try and get our heads around the the frantic uh, and the intensely emotional um, uh, electricity of possession. It's worth remembering that he was uh, fresh off a project which had been that difficult and traumatic. So he arrives in France um, with his new passport and heads straight to the Cannes Film Festival uh, and begins uh, hustling to try and get the money together to make possession. Um, at this point, it was just a 20-page treatment. Um, so what, was, um, uh, what else was feeding into this? What, what, what other factors are there that kind of leave uh, that help us to understand the, the emotional uh, uh, background to possession. Well, again, some people may know this. Um, 
one of the <coughs> dominant emotional influences on possession was the breakdown of uh, Shirovsky's marriage to uh, an actress called Malga Jata Brownek, who'd been the star of Third Part of the Night, and she was uh, the lead actress in, in uh, The Devil as well. Um, in 1976, uh, Brownek, Malga Jata Brownek, met uh, a Swedish journalist and a uh, Zen Buddhist called um, uh, Krajewski, uh, Andrzej Krajewski. Uh, this, uh, first of all, influenced her in her um, religious beliefs. She became a, a Zen Buddhist. She, she remained a Zen Buddhist for the rest of her life. Um, and it led to the breakup of her relationship with uh, Shuaski. Um, possession, uh, again, for, for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, you may well know that it involves uh, a collapsing marriage as, as the essential kind of uh, the beginning of the story. Well, the, um, uh, a great deal of the uh, core marital drama of Possession is very autobiographical. It's, um, um, Andrzej Zhuavsky was very open about this in later years. He said, you know, much of the uh, dialogue in the uh, Scenes involving uh, Ajani and Sam Neil in the breakdown, the relation, relationship breakdown scenes. There's a lot of that dialogue came from memories of actual conversations. So you are starting with something which has a, a, lot, a lot of basis in, in a very traumatic emotional reality for, for Zhuavsky. Um So if you take that and you add together, um, you add together that with the, the uh, trouble with Silver Globe, you're looking at um, a cocktail of stress and anger, frustration, uh, and it perhaps explains the, uh, the explosive quality of possession. Um, also, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded as well of, there's a, a Bob Dylan song called A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, um, which he wrote during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, uh, the imagery is very, very uh, fragmented, and there are lots and lots of uh, lines that don't appear to necessarily kind of uh, tell a progressive story, but more like a sort of a collage. And he was asked what on earth this song was about, and he said, well, I wrote it during the Cuban Missile Crisis when I was very worried that um, we weren't going to be around for much longer and the world was going to get blown to bits. And I thought, well, I've got all these songs that I haven't finished writing yet, so I'm just going to bundle them all together and sort of like do put them in one song in case that's, the only, that's all the time we've got. Um, Possession's got that feeling as well. It's got this kind of apocalyptic feeling as if it's kind of almost bulging with more ideas than a movie would normally, n normally know what to do with. Um, there are um, subplots <coughs> and, and digressions and, and, ex and extemporizations that kind of leap out during the film that feel, add to the sensation of it being a film where everything is turned up beyond, well, I'm not gonna say turned up to 11, but you know what I mean. It's kind of, um, it's a very, very intense movie that is kind of crammed to the gills with ideas, and uh, there's never a dull moment, never a dull frame. Um, there's always something to kind of tax your um, um, your your understanding and to and to challenge your, your intelligence. Um, so, when Zhuavsky was initially writing this project, um, uh, for those of you who've seen the film and you know that it's set in uh, Berlin, pre-unification Berlin, it may seem strange to think that it was actually once plan to, uh, to be located somewhere else entirely, and somewhere really very different, which was Montreal. <laughs> um, the, uh, the money initially for the development of the story came from a French-Canadian-American deal. Uh, the idea was that it was going to be shot in Montreal in 1979, uh, and um, Paramount Pictures had some involvement in the early stages. Um, Zhuavsky said that uh, if Montreal had not worked out, then he was considering the possibility of shooting in one of the major industrial ci uh, uh, cities in America, like D Detroit or Chicago. Um, quite hard to imagine, obviously, now that we know the film as it is, but still, this is a, an alternate uh, path for the film that was never taken. Um, he wrote it, um, he wrote his first treatment, his first draft anyway, in um, a hotel uh, in, uh, overlooking Central Park in, in New York. Uh, with sh uh, seagulls shrieking outside the window. Um, <coughs> difficult to imagine a film of this deeply European, deeply uh, surrealistic uh, nature being written in this really rather um, uh, ap uh, opposite sort of um, uh, environment, you know, kind of a, a <coughs> hotel overlooking Central Park in New York. just seems such a strange place to be writing this movie. Um, but there it was, it was done, it was written, and um, with the help of a, another 
American writer Frederick Tewton. Uh, also, before it reached the screen, there was um, the casting process was never really set in stone until quite late on. In fact, uh, as late as May, and the film was shot in July uh, of 1980, uh, as late as May, um, Chris Sarandon was going to be the, the male lead in the part that Sam Neill plays. Um, Judy Davis had been talked about as, a, as, a, as the female lead, which would have been interesting. Um, I think uh, Sterling Hayden was attached to the project. Uh, there was a, a German actor called um, uh, Wolfgang Kiem, I think it was called, who had just been in a movie called Rendezvous with Anna, uh, playing a character called Heinrich. A uh, strange sort of uh, almost coincidence there with, uh, evidently as a German actor, he would have ended up playing Heinrich, having a, a rendezvous with Anna for certain. <laughs> but that wasn't the case. Uh, the actor that ended up playing the role was Heinz Bennett, of course, um, does a remarkable job playing a character that the director, well, yeah, uh, represented a person that the director was not very fond of, but does an immaculate job in bringing that, <laughs> that fellow to the screen. Um, so, um, yes, Possession mm. arrived uh, in uh, 1981 uh, to, initially, uh, a very positive response. The, uh, the Cannes Film Festival uh, gave Isabella Jani the, um, the Best Actress uh, uh, nod for the, for the, for the film. Um, Jurovsky himself uh, did not uh, receive Best Film, uh, Best Director for this. I think Andre Vida won, won that year for, was it Man of Iron? Or um, but <coughs> Solidarity was uh, big news at the time, the, the Polish uh, trade union organisation Solidarity and the Vida film was about that movement and um, there's no question that uh, the Vida film was the film of the moment so, uh, so Zhuwaski accepted with you know, a great deal of good grace the fact that he was not the person to get the nod for the film and of course um, Isabella Shani's role is the most attention grabbing, the most startling uh, aspect of the film. Um, well, when that was, um, when the film was put to an English speaking audience, it didn't really work out. I mean, certainly the French uh, seemed to uh, get a grip on it. Not everyone liked it in, in, in France, the, not all the reviews in France were good, but at least it was accepted. Uh, it, there, was a, there was a film culture that knew how to cope with what uh, Zhuaski was doing. Um, in England, uh, I mean, it opened here for two weeks uh, in the cinema, I think, received a couple of, at best, perplexed reviews, at worst, very hostile reviews, and the kinds of uh, descriptions that it got were well, pretentious, uh, incoherent, uh, unbearably, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, hysterical. The, these, these sort of descriptors that are kind of pointing out certain aspects of the film as if they're somehow accidental, <laughs> as, as if as if it's a sort of a, a failure, like he's like he's dropped the ball and it's all gone horribly wrong. And, and yes, the, the, this kind of shrieking, intense quality was some sort of terrible accident. Well, it, it really wasn't. Um, and uh, Zhuaski once said, um, he said, I think it shows what's missing in the in the psyches of these people. He said, you know, sort of whispering, anybody can do it, but go and shriek, it's difficult. <laughs> suggesting, you know, obviously that uh, the reason why certain critics couldn't really get behind the film was because emotionally they were too buttoned down to know what to do with the film that was flying off at them in such an intense way. Um, America, well, it went even, uh, even worse in America, sadly. I mean, uh, the film's about 123 minutes uh, in its real version. I think in America it ended up at 79 minutes. Uh, 40, 40, mm, yeah, uh, 40 minutes taken out. It's, I do have that version. I've got a terrible VHS quality version of it. I can't. I can't watch it. I mean, it's. It's. It feels like you know. It feels wrong to even start to watch it. I've watched it on fast forward and just you know, it's just unbearable. But uh, so yes, I mean, uh, given there is a very challenging film with a lot of ideas brimming around and and plays with the limits of understanding. It's not a film that's intended intended to be fully digested. It's a film that takes you up to the edge of the ineffable, the indescribable, the point at which language breaks down, the point at which our understanding of ourselves breaks down. The idea that a film dealing with complex ideas and emotions like that could then be cut virtually in half and be expected to make sense to people is just bizarre. Um, I think it ended up playing on a double bill 
with um, uh, ice pirates, <laughs> and a kind of a, a sci-fi adventure comedy film by MGM. <laughs> one of the most bewildering double bills I think anyone's ever put together, so quite what the response would have been. It would be interesting to have been an usher, I think, <laughs> at that show, just to see how that went down. But, um, yeah, I, it's little wonder that uh, Zhuavsky in later years decided that he was not really interested in chasing the English-speaking market. Um, you know, I mean, so after, you've, after you've had your film butchered in that way and, and you've met with incomprehension at best and hostility at worst then you know what's the point but uh, <coughs> I'm glad to say over the years uh, possessions stock has risen uh, even in England and in America I think uh, as times have moved on people have had a chance to give it another try if they were initially alienated by the film they've gone back and, and reevaluated it um, part of the problem was always uh, that it rests uncomfortably in between two kinds of cinema, I suppose. Uh, between horror cinema uh, and um, uh, what I sort of loosely we, would, we used to call European art cinema. Um, <coughs> and it doesn't really fully belong in either of those categories entirely. Uh, I mean, it's, it's thematically too big and sprawling and complex to be fully a horror film. It, it's got <coughs> tentacles. If well, uh, kind of in too many different areas um, uh, to be purely a horror film. That's not to denigrate the horror genre, because there are many, many wonderful horror films that are definitely horror films, but Possession, you know, is more than a horror film. It's got other things going on as well. But it's also, um, it's also beyond naturalism. This is something that uh, Shuraski was very keen to, to um, talk about in interviews. Was, that he felt that naturalism could only take you so far in the story that he wanted to tell. Um, and that at a certain point you had to change gear. And he changed gear into fable, into uh, a mythic structure. There's a quality of uh, the journey into the underworld in this. And also perhaps even a little trace of the Heart of Darkness story. Um, a man who's going into the blackness of the soul uh, to, uh, to look for and find a woman in this case, uh, and to attempt to bring her back. Um, so there are themes from the early films, there are themes from the unmade films uh, kicking around in this, in this movie. Um, it's too extreme for naturalistic, you know, kind of a bourgeois, comfy uh, uh, art cinema. And it's, <coughs> it's a little bit too intellectually uh, complex uh, and verbally complex, perhaps, to rest comfortably in the horror genre. So you need to kind of have both heads on, if you like, to sort of try and get it, try and work out how to take it. Well, um, I'm not going to talk very much more about it, just a little bit about um, some of the projects which uh, Angers was considering after possession. I'll just briefly talk about those. Um, he was uh, planning to jump straight from possession into a project called Espion Lève Toi, uh, which I think means a spy stand-up or stand-up spy. Um, Intriguing project because this was going to be co-written with George Mark Stein. I don't know if anyone's familiar with George Mark Stein. He was one of the uh, creators of The Prisoner, the TV series The Prisoner. Uh, he and Patrick McGoohan kind of worked up the ideas for, for that series. And he was, um, the reason he was so useful to McGoohan on that project was that he had experience with MI5 and uh, with uh, the British uh, Secret Service, the spy, you know, spying was, was part of his old uh, CV. Um, so evidently, uh, there's, there's, a, there's an espionage element to possession, which obviously Zhuavsky felt he still had some mileage in that he wanted to explore, but that project never happened. Um, there was also a, a multi-header project with Valerian Borovchik and Serge Gainsbourg, which was going to be called, um, well, rather unpromisingly, it was going to be called Call Girls. I don't know really what that was going to be about, but uh, it was, there was a vogue, if you remember, for sort of multi-director stories where uh, you would get several people contributing kind of short stories into a film package. Um, that unfortunately never happened. The most intriguing, I think, of the projects which he was considering after possession, uh, and this is a strange one, I must say, is um, something called nevrosis or neurosis. Uh, now this was going to be the directorial debut of Jean-Marc Saron. Now I don't know if anyone's a disco fan here, uh, remembers Supernature by Saron, but uh, this was a 
uh, a disco music producer, a European Euro disco producer from the late 1970s who made a lot of money and evidently wanted to, to uh, branch out into the cinema and uh, had this project called Nevros lined up to go. Jaworski was a financial backer of this project and uh, had signed on as technical advisor, which I guess means if you've got a first time director uh, who really doesn't know his way around the film set, then uh, Jaworski was going to be the, um, the man who bailed him out of any tight corners along the way. <coughs> Again, this project never happened, but I'm just gonna read you a little um, uh, comment from one of the writers of the project, uh, just to kind of whet your appetite for what, uh, for what never happened. <laughs> um, Patrick, mm, uh, sorry, Jean-Patrick Machette said that um, it was going to be an improbable, fantastic, supernatural screenplay, a contraption with telepathy and apparitions, but it was totally calamitous and the requirements of Saron were absurd. I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like we missed something. There's <laughs> a project I would really, really like to have known what a Zhuavsky, Saron, absurdist, supernatural telepathy <laughs> movie would have been like. Um, but it never happened. So, I mean, but improbable, fantastic, supernatural, absurdist. Well, we kind of already got that, haven't we, with possession? That's, those terms work perfectly well as, as uh, tantalizing uh, descriptions of possession. So maybe we should just accept that uh, possession is, was, always will be probably a totally unique film experience uh, with nothing at all like it, not even Saron's uh, movie. Right. So, um, and also, I, I'm just gonna leave you with one line, and I think it's just uh, bearing in mind uh, Zhuavsky's um, taste for the surreal. Um, I think it's a, just a term that just seems to kind of light up so many lights when you think about the film. And it's, it's that old saying from Andre Breton um, that uh, beauty should be convulsive or not at all. Well, I think Andre Breton would have had his fucking brains blown out by this movie, so <laughs> enjoy.